Thanks a lot, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here to talk to you about K2 Fire today. Um, it's a very exciting story uh, with a few years of history behind it now, so we can demonstrate uh, a very good investment proposition uh, as our co company continues to grow uh, and on our path to operating cash flow break even. Um, so bear with me while I get through the, uh, the usual stuff uh, and start to give you an overview. So, K2 Fly is a very purpose-driven organisation. Um, we are pioneers in something that we're calling resource governance. Um, so we're, first of all, we're a software business, we're not a consulting business. We uh, derive our revenues predominantly through recurring software licences, and I'll talk about that a bit more la later and show you the numbers to do with that. Um, but resource governance is an increasingly important space as the world uh, shifts to net zero and needing more mining in order to do that. Um, but also this thing called radical transparency and that's been driven by people such as yourselves who um, are all obviously interested in profit but also interested in doing the right thing in terms of wanting the companies that you're investing in to be doing the right things in the communities in which they operate. It all sounds uh, it might sound very grand and grandiose to a certain extent, but it's really, really important. And the main thing that you need to understand that the, is that the biggest driver uh, of this change in these behaviours of these organisations is actually coming from finance. So the finance organisations that are funding these companies and particularly these mining organisations are absolutely making sure that they uh, adhere to the right regulations and that's regulatory, but also what company and civil standards demand. So if you think about um, what happened with Rio Tinto last year, or well, two years ago, they didn't actually break a law, right? They didn't break a law, but they crossed the line that the community said that's not good enough. So there's this blending going on that I'll, that I'll talk about too. So who are we talking to? We're talking to board members and it's noisy, this isn't it? Um, board members and, uh, and executives in these major mining companies. Uh, I'll talk about it in the next slide in terms of our customer base. Um, but this is a survey of the biggest uh, mining companies by the biggest sort of consultants in the world. And um, in terms of what keeps CEOs and board members up at night, and there's an overwhelming preponderance here of environmental social governance licensed to operate which is key. So there's two pot, there's, there's license to operate, which is your, fun, your foundational access to these properties in order to mine them and develop them. But then there's your social license to operate. So you might have the tenement or the access to the land, but do you have the community support in which to do that? And given the scale of mining that we require going forward um, in order to make the energy transition, you need that social license. You need the community behind you. You need your Financiers behind, you need your regulators behind, you need all of that. And that's what we help these organisations with through very, very, um, through operational software that drives their ESG performance, but also importantly, how they disclose that to the market. Now, I talked about, you know, the grandiose nature of what we're looking to achieve here, and we are passionate about this subject. Most of the people in our organisation have spent many, many years in the mining industry, and we're firm believers in the mining industry and the importance of the mining industry. Um, but we, we also believe passionately that the mining industry can do a better job of talking about itself and working with the communities. So do these organisations, by the way. So, um, as I said, in terms of who, who's, who's buying this, well, seven of the top ten mining companies in the world are using our solutions now. We have ten solutions, as you can see, along the bottom ribbon there. Not all of those companies use all those solutions. That is the addressable market that we are talking about, but we have contracts with all those companies that you can see very highly represented in the majors. So this is a um, what, what we're talking about with K2Fly is not just an Australian company, it's very much a global company. 40% of our revenues are coming from outside of Australia, that is 20% from the um, US market and 20% from Europe, Middle East and Africa. So you can see a global issue that we're addressing uh, with global multi-commodity, multi-site multi, multi -site miners taking this up. So that creates a massive white space for us to move into. Really, really well represented, obviously, in the iron ores, gold sectors, but also across the emerging sectors of um, energy transition. Important point here. Um, in order for the world to make the energy transition, which we all believe in, we need about 300 new mines. We haven't been doing that a lot lately. There's been a lot of mine shifting ownership and things like that 
in order for those 300 mines uh, to get started to, to, to deliver the critical minerals in order to you know, build electric vehicles, to build batteries, to build wind turbines, you need a lot of these, these, these mines to be opening and, ra and rapidly. So they can't do that without these approvals and without the, the buy-in of their investors and the, the communities in which they operate. So that's a tremendous opportunity for us. Outside of that, there's also a lot of other land use where we can move into. So we've been very focused on the mining industry, as you can see, but we have a number of opportunities in the utilities business, in, in large ag, uh, um, oil and gas, uh, that, we can, that we can grow our base in. So I just want to come back to um, why it is that people use us and, and what's, what's fundamentally changing in the world today in order that's driving the business and driving those major companies towards us. So if you look at the way a mining company is valued, traditionally, it's, it's what inventory they have in the ground. So, you know, tons and grade, prevailing price of the day, generally provides the value of that or the price or the value of that stock. Very basic mining economics, right? Um, and what you're seeing there in terms of the pictures is a, is a segment of our solutions that we provide to these companies. And a lot of them start very much on that left-hand side. How they disclose their inventories to the stock market, hence the value. So what we provide goes into their annual report. Um, I saw the response of the, the uh, involvement earlier on, but how many of you are, as investors are, have direct or indirect investment in mining companies? Most of you, right? Not surprising in an Australian investment audience. So most of you are probably aware of Jork, which is the way of, you know, hands up if, you have, if you've heard of Jork as the way. So that's essentially what this, is, this resource disclosure is doing. But not just for Jork, it does it for every stock market in the world and every standard, because they're, they're, they're slightly different in each. It's like a payroll bureau. In each jurisdiction, they're slightly, there's different voided versions of Jork, which sit, sit under a global standard called Crisco. So we manage that and we manage the disclosure of that to the stock market, really important. Goes in the annual report, constitutes the value. So that is a value driver and a historical one. As you move to the right, you see all these other things. And they're really, really important for these organisations to get and really, really important, increasingly important to get right because they are, if you do them well, they're value accretive. If you do them badly, they're value destructors. Um, and I mentioned the heritage situation uh, a little earlier. Rio Tinto now use our heritage system. I stress post the event, not before the event. Um, and you know, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't make light of it because that was a, a tragedy uh, of cultural heritage destruction. And um, you know, so, so again, as I said, they didn't actually break a law. So there's a merging now of hard law, which is what you see in the left-hand side, regulatory law where you get pinged by ASIC or whatever you, the regulatory the either is. As it moves across, it sort of gets into what we call soft law. The difference in terms of the effect on your, shot, on your stock price is the same, all right? So those things are blurring rapidly and that's what we're managing and helping these organisations to address all of those things um, in, in, in what looks today like quite specific uh, areas to do with mining and value creation or destruction. So a very important point and that is just continuing to grow. Um, we're in Melbourne but you, you're probably reading the, the press about the new Cultural Heritage Act in, in Western Australia and the impacts that they're having not just on the mining sector but on ag providers and all sorts of people that are subject to that act, right? Again, we manage those land uh, obligations, uh, both regulatory and non-regulatory. So what, what makes it so important is protecting that licence to operate and that social licence to operate, keeping the faith of your investors that what you're disclosing to the market is trusted um, and that is a big issue for the industry right now. We not need all these mines but there is a big lack of trust in the mining industry uh, not necessarily just from investors, but from communities as well. And they can't operate without that support. So the other thing is, and we're now seeing um, legislation come out from ASIC, which is anti-greenwashing legislation. So it means you can't just put releases and statements out there without having them backed up by proper facts that are, can be audited and proven that you are doing what you say you're doing. And that's where we come in, by providing those robust systems that are auditable and help you disclose properly. So that's a quick snapshot of the, the solutions that we provide in resource governance, so natural resource governance, how we manage land and how we disclose what we're doing on, on the land. Mineral resource governance, how we disclose what we've got in the ground, which as investors, of course, you can't see, so you need to be able to trust, and then the technical assurance that sits underneath that. Quick, I'll get into the corporate now. So I've talked about the why um, in terms of the business. 
um, very, very tightly held uh, in as much as about 66% of, uh, of, the, of the share register is held by institutions. Um, so that's institutional investors um, like, um, like First Centia, like Tribeca, both of whom uh, are, are investing in K2 Fly, not as a mining company, which they're investing out of their mining investment funds, but they're investing in a technology that supports those mining companies and helps them do a better job. So that's a really interesting synergy when you look at that, right? So these guys run massive funds investing in mining opportunities, but they're, they're looking at this and saying that's really important for what we do. West Farmers are on there as well, um, and Regal. And then last year we took uh, a 13% strategic investment from the world's largest privately owned mining software business, which happens to be an Australian business called MapTech, based out of South Australia originally, been around for 40 years. Uh, this, this company uh, is, is worth a hell of a lot, but it's private, so I can't disclose what that is. But they, they, if they, by, by they're doing 120 million, roughly, of revenue per year. So they are a big organisation, a big gorilla in this market. Why did they invest in K2Fly when they've been around for 40 years and they're much bigger than us? Because they recognise what we're doing and how important it is for the industry that they play in. They also recognise it would take them a lot of time, money and risk in order to build what we're doing. So they said, these guys are doing a fantastic job. Let's get on board with that. So we really welcome their in involvement. Um, the chairman sits on our board, Peter Johnson, uh, and they're adding a lot of value. So a lot of the stock is held already, uh, a small amount in retail. Um, annual recurring revenue, I'll come back to that um, in a little while. And then cash, uh, plenty of cash. We've got 4.4 million in the bank uh, and, a, and a $2 million facility, which we haven't called on yet. So we've got a very nice cash platform in order to proceed. So I'm just going to finish off with some results. As I said, this is a business that's been around for a little while now, so it's, it's real and we have, a, a, I guess, a history. Um, we finished up the year really strongly. Our, our three-year uh, compound annual growth rate is about 45%. As I said, we're, we're winning. We're, we're, we're doing, we, our strategy is land and expand. We land our first solution in these major clients and then we start to build out from there. And again, we're selling to the corporate buyers here, so a lot of what we do goes across the organisation from day one, which is a really rapid way of getting sites on board that we can expand into. So annual recurring revenue is a key um, part of our, of our metrics. So that's the top left-hand side there. So you can see constant, constant growth there, 25% uh, growth over the year in that recurring revenue. So that out of revenues of, uh, I think in FY23, they ended up at sort of 12 million bucks. Uh, you got 7.5 of that million rolling over to the next year at least. And then total contract value go, rises and falls on, on where we are in terms of delivering projects. Um, that's a little out of date now because we've obviously signed business that we've announced in this quarter already with Roy Hill has took our ground disturbance solution in the Pilbara. So that, um, that total contract value would be sort of closer to 19 plus million uh, back, up, back up where it goes. So that constantly depletes every month as you're, as you're invoicing. So that's a trigger, but the, the one that you can rely on is that rolling over that 7.5 mil. Um, so um, nice growth that you can see in all of those numbers over the years. And, and now that we've delivered on a lot of our products, we can actually really scale that. Um, the other key thing for investors such as yourself, which is a big thing at the moment, is, is the path to operating cash flow. So on the top right hand side there, you can see the graph uh, is getting smaller. Uh, and in fact, you know, if it wasn't for one late payment, at the end of June, uh, we might have been uh, a lot closer to operating cash flow break even, which is obviously a, a really important milestone in this, in this business in order for us to grow. So with that, I'd just like to wrap up uh, and talk about, clearly we have strong growth metrics, incredible industry dynamics behind us, both globally and also in, in the industry that we support, um, and really, really sticky recurring revenues within our client base, which is global tier ones. Thank you very much for it, and I'll let you get to lunch.